Well, Peter Sagel, welcome to the public. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, we're, we're doing the series where we meet the voices of, of public radio and, and learn a bit about the, the shows that we're used to listening to on NPR and other public radio venues. Um, now, you've said a few times in, in interviews I've read that uh, you being in the position you're in is basically an insult to anyone who's ever wanted to host a, a public radio show. Uh, now, you are a playwright. Um, yes. Can, can you tell me about how you actually first ended up like, being involved with Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me? Yeah, well, it's all, uh, as I've said in other contexts, uh, utterly dumb luck um, in that I was basically living in New York with my then wife, who was pregnant with our first child, who's now 16. And I was a playwright and uh, was trying to be a screenwriter. And uh, like all writers, I procrastinated a lot. And my choice of procrastination was listening to public radio. And I used to sit around and say, oh, I could do that. I mean, honestly, how hard is it to just gas on about something for an hour or so? And were you thinking of programs in particular, like the news programs? Um, you or? know, I mean, I was just in general an NPR fan, you know, in the sense of, of, uh, of like, you know, the, the, the Robert Siegels and Scott Simons of the world, you know, who, who just sort of were charming and, and, and witty and, and serious and obviously sensitive. I mean, I basically, I had a crush on them, what can I say? But also listening to things like um, This American Life, which at that time, relied a lot more on you know really great first person narratives than I, I think it has evolved to now and so I was like I could be a sensitive guy on this American life what's what's what, what's the hold up here <laughs> and of course and this is where I'm I'm an insult to everybody who actually works for these did I submit a story to this American life did I start my own radio show did I did I go to work as Ira Glass did when he was 18 or 19 for NPR cutting tape no I didn't do anything I just sat around and said I deserve this I shall not do anything to get it and went back to my, my life. And then one day I got a phone call from somebody who knew somebody at uh, NPR who was putting together this brand new show called Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And they were looking, uh, the quote was, for funny people who read a lot of newspapers. And uh, my friend thought of me, and so I was connected. I auditioned, and the next thing I knew, I was a panelist on this brand new public radio show. And what was, what was the audition like? Uh, basically, as I remember it, I got on my phone, and the producer at the time, a man named David Green, set us up with various, you know, fake panels, and we sort of rehearsed a version of the radio show. I believe I remember that Carl Castle was a uh, part of it, but every time we did it, there'd be a different cast of characters, and I must have done it like three times, you know. Uh, and you know, to, on this day's, you know, a, a practice round or audition round, whatever you want to call it, the host was person X, the other two panelists were these two people, and here was Carl Castle. And I, I never. I should say, was considered at that time to be the host. I was strictly as a possible panelist. And when the show was cast or finalized, whatever you want to call it, in mid-1997, I was included on the list of people who would be panelists. Once they established who the host would be and, and who the panelists would be, we did a bunch of practice shows throughout the fall of 97, and we went on the air with a real show in January of 98. And, and did, the, did the practice shows go well? Um... Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I used to get in trouble for saying this because the people who did this, of course, are still around and in, in some cases are still my friends. But I feel that, um, I feel that since I was also a part of it, I get, I get, I get to say this, uh, that the show really wasn't very good uh, when it started. Uh, and that was true for a bunch of reasons. Um, you know, it, it was a show that, unlike a lot of shows... Uh, was 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 sort of being launched nationally without a natural kind of adolescence. Uh, Car Talk started as a local show on WBUR. Uh, Fresh Air started as a local show uh, at HYY, and 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 those shows had this chance to sort of shake themselves out, find out what worked, find out what didn't, get good at it before they went on a national stage. We we even though we were not nationally broadcast, we were only on eight or nine stations when we started. We were still being offered as a national show. So we had to have this awkward adolescence. In addition, you know, it's, it's NPR doing comedy. And NPR, not its strength, shall we say. I mean, you, when people think of NPR, and public radio in general, perhaps, but certainly NPR, people don't think, my God, those guys are funny. Yeah. Those guys are totally on it when it comes to producing a really funny show. And, and, and so there was that. I mean, in fact, one of the problems we faced early on was trying to figure out how funny we should be, right? In, in what sense? Because it's still NPR. Well, it's, it's like it's still NPR, right? Who tunes into NPR 
for comedy. People tune in for NPR for new, for news and information. So, so it'd almost be hurting the brand if it was too off off kilter. Exactly. And and so uh, one of the things that I remember very vividly was on the very first show, the one that was broadcast. The very first question was based. They played a piece, and I answered the very first question. Um, was a piece of tape of people screaming in terror. And they said, what is that? And I'm like, and, and I just couldn't believe that they would start the show, literally start it, the very first episode, with what it was apparently, to my ears, i.e., a bunch of people screaming in terror. So I remember making a lame guess as to what it might be instead. But no, it was a bunch of people screaming in terror. There had been... Literally screaming in terror. Literally screaming in terror. There had been a flight over the Pacific, I think, that had this tremendous amount of turbulence that, that so much so that people who were not belted into their seats flew up into the ceiling. Um, and somebody had recorded it. And that's the tape they started with, right? And, uh, you know, uh, what were we thinking uh, to start a comedy show with that. And what we were probably thinking was, well, this is NPR, this is news, this is, you know, everybody in NPR is attuned to, to audio tape that really is evocative. This is a great piece of tape. Let's ask about it. And nobody stopped to think, well, wait a minute, this is a comedy show. Nobody wants to hear people screaming in terror. Did you get reaction for that piece specifically? Well, thankfully, nobody was listening. Like I said, <laughs> we didn't start with a lot of listeners. But that was sort of that was one of the problems, you know, is that nobody really knew how serious to be, how goofy, where the line was, you know. In fact, if I think personally of a key moment that the show sort of started on its road to where we are, uh, I was you know, brought in to be the new host in May of uh, 98. And we had a meeting because the show was in trouble. People weren't liking it. And we looked at each other. I remember this room very vividly. And I said, okay, you know, we have a chance here to restart. I'm the host now. You know, it's, we take a breath. We've been given a second chance. Um, what do you want to do? Do you want to like try to make a serious quiz? Because it wasn't clear what we were going to do. Do you want to make a serious quiz that like serious public radio listeners can tune in and see how they do? right? Like say the New York Times news quiz they used to run just so they can feel good about themselves because they know the answer. Or do you want to do something goofy where we just screw around as long as we can and have as much fun until they cancel us, which we thought was imminent. You, um, you did? You thought you thought you Well, were. I mean, going back, I mean, let me put it this way. We were having trouble getting stations. We, we knew that the public radio community wasn't thrilled with us. They felt that the show wasn't as good as it should be. They, some, of the, some of the stations were getting angry hate mail, you know, Oh, and nobody can get as indignant and as angry as a public radio listener. And so, you know, let me put it this way. If we had gotten a phone call from NPR in the fall of 98 saying, it's just not working, guys, I'm sorry, it's not where we need it to be, I wouldn't have been surprised. P the public radio program directors used a, a listserv type communication system to communicate. I mean, they may still do, for all I know. Where there had been a lot of angry chat. I got to see some of it about our show. You know, just like, I can't believe NPR is doing this one one guy, one program director, uh, now gone from the system, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, proudly told us, and this, by the way, was a compliment once he changed his mind about us, that he said to his colleagues, you know, people said to him, oh, you know, the show is improving. And he said, well, you can't wash garbage. <laughs> so he really didn't think highly. No, no. What I do know is that Doug Berman sent out a note to the community on that system that I mentioned, that bulletin board type thing. And basically said, you know, broadly paraphrasing, we know, it's, we know it's been difficult, but we're making big changes. Trust me, I got this. And he basically put his credibility in the line or, or, or basically asked, he said to people, look, it's me. I'm the guy who gave you Car Talk, which is the most successful show you have. It raises all this money for you. I know what I'm doing. Trust me, we're making changes. It's going to be great. And because of that, people gave us a second chance. And, you know, we spent the year of 98, 99 trying to, uh, to reestablish ourselves with the program directors. I remember uh, the PRC in 99 was in Washington, D.C. This was the public radio conference that you probably have heard of. I remember we went and we did a live version of the show. I think it's the first time we ever did our show in front of a live audience of any kind. And we had, and, and we did a version of our show. It wasn't broadcast or even as far as I know recorded. It was just to show the assembled public radio people, you know, what we were doing now. 
and how much better it was than, say, that pilot tape they had maybe listened to a year or two before. Um, and uh, it was great. It went really well. I remember one thing Doug said. He said, we got to give them food. You just put out free food. They'll come. And he was right. The place packed. You know, everybody was eating burritos or tacos or whatever it was out of the chafing dishes. And we did that. I remember we all had black tie. And we did like this half-hour version of the show. And people walked away from it going, oh, that was pretty funny. You know, and we basically said, we're doing this every week. I quickly want to go back to you actually coming to, to radio. I mean, what you said earlier about uh, wanting to be a public radio host or imagining that you could do it uh, and then getting this phone call. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. Had you told anyone that you you would be interested in doing public radio or was this phone call really out of the blue that you got from your friend? It was it was it was really out of the blue. I had never said to anybody, um, I would like to host a public radio show. I said it to myself. You know, in the same way that you sit around and, you know, you, you watch movies and you're like, I could be in a movie. It's like that. You know, you don't say it out loud because my, my friends here would be like, what are you talking about? You could never do that. You never actually try it because then you'd find that out, right? So it was just, it was that. It was just dumb. But one thing I do remember is this. As I said, I was working as a playwright. And, uh, you know, one of the very frustrating things about being a playwright, in addition to the general inability to make a living is uh, everything happens very slowly. You write something, people say, oh, this is great. Maybe we'll consider it for next season. We'll let you know four months. It's like it's this very slow moving thing, right? Mm -hmm. you, sit, you, you, know, you, you, you sit around and wait. And, and once we started doing the show and we were doing you know, these shows every week, I remember saying to my agent at the time, this is awesome because we get to do a radio show every week. And if it sucks, we just get to do another one the next week. It's fun. You know, there's this sort of, I loved being, putting out a new thing every week. And God heard me because it wasn't long after that that I got a call offering me to be the chance to be the host. And it, was it really refreshing to, to suddenly have a, a structure around you? I mean, it's the polar opposite in a way from being a player, right? Yeah. I mean, it was fun. I, I, as you indicated, you know, being a writer is a lonely business. It's just you. And, you know, the theater is, the theater is where you go if you're a writer, but you're desperate for other people to be around because you know you're writing in the hopes that you'll have a collaborative experience with it, as opposed to you know being a novelist where you just publish it and sit down and start doing it again. So yeah, I really loved the fact that once I started doing the show, once I became the host of the show, I, I had these people to work with. I mean, even though sometimes I drive them crazy or they drive me crazy, you know, we're still sort of doing this thing together and collaborating on this thing. And then you add the aspect of the panelists and all the technicians. And basically every week now we get to put on a play or a show at least. I was curious, like so much of the show is um, based around wit uh, and, and getting to uh, uh, be quick on your feet. Yes. Both of, of yourself and, and the panelists. Now you've talked a lot about how, you know, you're generally a, a rather anxious person. And, you yes. know, a lot of comedians have talked about how, you know, this is true for them too. And, and, uh, they use comedy as a way or adopted comedy uh, growing up as a way to almost a, a survival technique to shield themselves from sort of, uh, I don't know, negative attention. Was, was that true for you at all um, growing up? Did, were you already using wit? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I was an awkward kid. I was I was my, I was interested in things that nobody else was interested in. I was somewhat chubby, you know, I, I, and, and whether, you know, that caused my insecurity, my insecurity, you know, led to my isolation. I don't know. But certainly, you know, and, and I feel this to this day, here is the great thing about comedy, that if people like what you just said, they let you know instantly. It's a feedback system. Mm -hmm. And for some, you know, they laugh, basically. And for some of us who grew up that way, we become addicted to the sound of laughter in the same way that, you know, you hear about these these rabbits I mean, or these rats that they hook up where they put a little line in their pleasure center in their brains and they can activate it by pushing a button <laughs> yeah. and, and rats starve to death because all they want to do is push the button. Yeah. I mean, we're a little bit like that. You know, if you're not laughing at something I'm saying, maybe you don't like me. It's like, I need you to laugh again. And so what did that look like when you were growing up? Were you, uh, were you the class clown or? Well, I mean, I was, I was far too self-conscious to be the class clown because uh, the true class clown has to be subversive, Right. The, the true class clown has to be willing to get him or herself thrown out of the class. Right. And, and that so wasn't my style. You know, I was so much, I was so, I, I was too, I was, I think I was too deferent to authority uh, to be a really great class clown, to be that kind of rebel figure. I was the guy who, who, who tried to be funny to make everybody like me, not to get anybody pissed at me. Uh, although I do remember one of my great moments was, uh, we had a student council election. Uh, 
and we had to write speeches. I mean, it was sort of this, you know, silly suburban high school um, exercise and fake civics. And we were supposed to make speeches and most of the speeches were like i believe that students should be involved and i basically got up and said in so many words this is utter bullshit this is the silliest thing we, we, we like we're going to make any difference as we're so we, it's like you know i i don't remember exactly what i said i wish i still had the speech but it's like you know you're basically asking the pig would like you know you're giving the pig a vote on how they get made into sausage you know this is a silly thing <laughs> and, and uh, so this was ostensibly as you were like a candidate a candidate and and because everybody liked my speech uh they voted me in and I got to be the vice president of the student council where I then, you know, tried to do a good job. But I do remember uh, getting a riot act read to me by a school administrator because they were afraid that I was calling for some sort of revolution. And the fact that I was being perceived as sort of potentially dangerous when I was the most helplessly, you know, suck up kid in the world was great to me. That was a thrill. I mean, I remember it vividly. Like somebody thought I I was going to cause trouble. Me. You know? Do you remember what grade this? I mean, what? Uh, like oh, I must in? have been a junior in high, in high school, I believe. And so suddenly you were getting this great feedback from from these kids that I guess you know the yeah, and, kids and, and you know, and, and everybody has that moment, you know, as a comedian or as a growing comedian, where you get up and and you sort of break the rules a little bit, and you're irreverent and you're funny and you get a laugh and people react to you, it, and that was sort of similar in a weird way because I wasn't a jock, right, and uh, I wasn't incredibly good looking. And I didn't do any of the things in a high school setting that get you attention. Those are fairly limited back in the day. I wasn't a musician. I didn't play in a rock band. But by making jokes, by standing up and making a speech, basically, I got some of that attention. And it was crazy, the fact that my limited talent could get me that kind of momentary, rather momentary, please, prestige and attention it was really exciting and it still is i mean i've heard you say that uh you were an overachiever and i mean you went yeah. to harvard so you might i did you, you must have been um this the speech sounds like it's the polar opposite in a way you're you know you're going against the the authorities you're getting in trouble well, that, that's what i mean that that's what was so odd for me and 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 in a way it was sort of a uh a harbinger of my life as it is now which is that you know i made this speech got a huge reaction by you know insulting the whole notion of this election as being important this whole this whole concept that it meant anything and what happened i got elected and i was in the student council and then the next year i was the president of the student council and i put it on my college application and i got into harvard right you know i've met real rebels and real comedians and the best comedians are rebels who would have walked away, you know, who having been elected to the student council, having made a speech like that, would have said, oh, fuck you, I meant every word I said, this is pointless. But I didn't have the courage to do that. And so that's why you end up, you know, being a comedian who makes up, who makes cutting remarks about powerful people on public radio, right? And, and I mean, this sounds like it's a, a quite political a political act. Were you interested in, in politics growing up? I, I, I wasn't as much as you might think. Um, I, you know, was, was a kid in the 70s where sort of a, a, a reaction, a sort of generational reaction to the, all the political activism of the 60s. It all seemed silly and pointless. Um, uh, I remember, for example, when I was 10 years old, uh, how annoyed I was, I guess I was nine years old, how annoyed I was at the Watergate hearings preempted my summer reruns. I mean, that's where I was politically. And I was not, you know, one of those kids who was like totally into it and, you know, read the paper every day with my dad and talked about politics. I mean, I, you know, I, I just didn't care that much. And I remember when I got to college, to Harvard, there were all these politically engaged people like, you know, who were very, you know, for example, really into the student divestment thing. Right. Is this for apartheid? You mean apartheid? Yeah. And you know they were building shanty towns in the yard. And I remember scoffing, like, "Oh, yeah, is not going to make any difference? This is silly. This is dumb. This is silly. This is dumb." It was just something else to make fun of. Uh, I, I, you know, I recently, you know, apologized on Twitter, I think, for making fun of those guys because you know they ended up making something of a difference. I think by by sort of creating public pressure on the apartheid state when the U.S. government at the time wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And I was recently trying to remember when it was. I started to get really interested in politics. Um, And I think it was, I mean, certainly by the time I got out of college, 
the transformation was complete. You know, this was, I went to college in 83. A lot of it had to do with Doonesbury. Really? The, the, the comic strip? Yeah. Because when you think about it again, you know, Doonesbury, what was Doonesbury doing? Doonesbury was making very funny satirical jokes about real current events that were very serious, you know? I mean, I remember reading a comic that um, Gary Trudeau had written about the Reagan electoral victory in 1980, where it's a bunch of Missouri liberal characters sitting around um, and the electoral results are coming in. It's Reagan in a landslide, right? And uh, I, remember, I remember the punchline. One of them says, I think I'll shoot myself. And the other one says, good choice. Handguns should be cheap and plentiful, <laughs> right? Which I thought was a very good joke, even though I didn't really understand it because I didn't really know who Ronald Reagan was and I didn't really know what was at stake and I didn't really understand anything, but it made me think like there was stuff to understand. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and I, and, and I just... I guess the way it ended up working out for me was I was interested in art. I was a theater guy, right? Mm -hmm. I was, that's my primary interest. And I found myself really uninterested in, in the kind of art or theater that was just purely solipsistic, that was people sitting around and talking about their problems. I became more interested in stuff that was more engaged in the world. More political, you could even say. In a way. I mean, the, the problem with politics is, is when you say the word politics, you know, you, what are you talking about? You're talking about, you know, casts of characters uh, engaged in very, you know, sort of kabuki-like fights for preeminence or whatever. But politics as a whole is like how we conduct ourselves. It's like, mm. you know, how, how stuff happens. What, what's going to get blown up and what's going to get saved? And, and, and what it is is it's really high stakes, real life drama. Right. And to this day, I still look at politics seriously when I'm thinking about it seriously, as opposed to just making jokes about it, is I think about it from a very theatrical perspective. Who are the characters? What do they want? What's their obstacle? Why do they want what they want? I mean, and that's really interesting to me, much more so than, you know, what's the best energy policy? Mm -hmm. And, And that's why, to sort of bring it back to what I do for a living, is why, in a weird way, comedy will be the best way to talk about politics. Because what we can do is we can insult people. We can say in a way that straightforward news is we can talk about characters and say, this is stupid. This is just dumb, right? In a way that, say, ABC News can't, we can't. And uh, I used to, t- this is getting way out of date, but I used to tell this sort of story to d- describe why I think my show has value. Um, back when Sarah Palin was running for vice president, um, her campaign made the claim that she had foreign policy expertise or credentials because you can see Russia from (laughs) Alaska. She didn't say, and then she then repeated the claim, but the McCain campaign said it first. She then repeated it. She never said, oh, you can see Russia from my house. That was Tina Fey on Saturday Night Live. But still, that was the claim. This person would be a qualified foreign policy expert, some potential president someday because you can see Russia from Alaska. And other news networks, you know, did what you do, which is they convened panels to discuss whether or not the proximity of Alaska to Russia gives her uh, foreign policy experience. They they talked about her role as the commander of the Alaska National Guard, if that's relevant. You know, mm-hmm. uh, one I think it was ABC News actually sent out a film crew to confirm that yes, you can see Russia from Alaska. On our show, I said this. I said I can see Lake Michigan from my office. Does that make me a sturgeon? <laughs> And, and, and that's what I mean, that, that if you can talk about the people as, as flawed humans, which is what comedy is about, comedy is about human flaws, right? Then you can actually get to a truth of it that I think you can't do if you're just going to assume everybody's acting rationally. They're not. Nobody is. Right. Sometimes you actually need to laugh to get to the absurd truth of it. Right. And sometimes, you know, you know a lot of people say, oh, I'm just a comedian. It's a dodge. But it also, it also gives you a little freedom. To, to sort of deny your own relevance, you know? I'm just a comedian, I'm just making jokes, so I can tell you the truth. In a weird way, what I'm doing every week is sort of what I was pretending to be doing during that speech back in junior high school. I'm sort of saying, all these pieces, this whole thing is stupid. And yet, just like then, I'm participating in the thing by saying how stupid it is. That's interesting, because I, I read that you, the reason you wanted to be a, a playwright was sort of you wanted to shock people out of their comfort zones or complacency. Yes. yes. Um, and it seems like, on the one hand, comedy seems like the complete opposite of that. It comforts people. 
But uh, on the other hand, it, it can be a way to make one uh, more open to uncomfortable truths in a way that you wouldn't face if it was just a, with a hard report. Well, well, that's the sort of thing that I, I, I struggle with uh, and have written about at some length. In fact, if you, if, if you want to see me talk about it somewhat seriously, you can look at a video I did of a commencement address at Warren Wilson College. Where, where I, I mean, and I think it, I think it, it has to do with my uh, a changing view of what people need, as opposed to what I wanted to do, right? Because when you're a young person and you're trying to be an artist, you want to shock people, and you never really think about what shocking people really involves. It involves making them feel uncomfortable. It involves scaring them. It involves m- making them realize, if you are really egotistical about it, how silly and stupid their lives are. You know, and that's a that's a classic. You know, I hope I die before I get old type mm-hmm. thing because I don't want to be like you old stupid people. Mm-hmm. And then you get older <laughs> and, and, and you start thinking, and this is how I put it in the commencement speech, I didn't start thinking about what other people really wanted. I started thinking about what I really wanted. And I didn't want to be shocked out of my complacency. I didn't want some angry young man telling me that what I loved and valued was stupid because uh, life is hard enough. You know, I, I needed some comfort. I needed, I needed some cheer. I, I, I didn't need necessarily somebody saying, "No, Peter, you're doing you're doing the right thing." But I needed somebody to give me a break from from the worry, and 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 I that's how I came to embrace what it is I do now. But then, but yet you see it as having an importance. It sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I do. I, I think it has a, a tremendous amount of importance. And and you know, I, I often describe myself my show as being the show that helps people get through boring tasks like, you know, stripping the paint in their bathroom or washing the dishes. And people come up to me and they say, oh, I never would have stripped my boat if it wasn't for you. Or, you know, you're the person I listen to when driving my kids around to soccer. I get that a lot. And that's great. You know, my joke is I help make, you know, tedious tasks more bearable. That's my role in life. Great. Mm -hmm. But I also hear from people who say, and and I talk about this less because it's less funny, but people come up and they say, you know, you got me through this really hard time. I was really ill this year. I went through a divorce this year. My mother died. My father died. Uh, and listening to your show was a real great break. And I look forward to it every week. And it was the highlight of my week. And I thank you. One amazing story um, is we got an email before a show that we did. I, I think it was in Tucson, Arizona. And, and a woman wrote about her wife and said, you know, she was in a coma through some reason. I don't know what happened, accident or illness. And she was sort of hovering in the line between life and death. And the doctor said, you know, it's really up to her whether she's going to live. If you want to help her, try to remind her of what she might want to come back to the side of the living for. And so said this woman's wife, we played tapes of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me for her because she always loved it. Really? Yeah. And she came out of the coma. And so, of course, you know, we responded to this and we gave them free tickets to the show and they came and they saw it. And like I said, at the commencement address, you know, either that was the most amazing, stirring, moving story of some good I did in the world or it was the most amazing scam to get free tickets to a radio show ever conceived. Either way, it's impressive, you know. Yeah. Has it done the same for you? Uh, comedy or Has hosting the show? Does it gone you through rough times? Well, you know the famous joke uh, about, uh, about uh, it's in, of all things, the comic book, uh, The Watchman. Uh, the guy goes to the doctor. He says, doctor. I'm miserable. I'm sad. I'm, I, 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 everything seems so bleak. I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I'm depressed all the time. And, and, and the doctor says, I know just for the thing. He says, the great comedian Pagliacci is in town. You should absolutely go see him. He will cheer you up. He's amazing. He's the funniest, most cheerful man in the world. And the guy says, doctor, I am Pagliacci. <laughs> and there have been times <laughs> where I have felt that way. But at the same time, even when I'm down about things, and I've been going through some personal stuff of late that's a little tricky, um, every week, whatever I'm going through, I get to put on a, this really great, funny show with my friends. And every week when I get to put on that really great, funny show with my friends, people come up to me afterwards and tell me how much they like it and how much it means to them and how grateful they are uh, that I get to do it. And, and how in the world can I complain about that? Um, I mean, I get this tremendous, I get this, do this really fun job. I have this tremendous feedback. It's great. Um, and I, 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 I can't help but love it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, can I tell you that, you know, it solves all my problems being able to do the show? No. Can I tell you it makes things a lot better because I have this really cool job doing this really great thing? It absolutely does. I, I want to ask you about the, back to the actual evolution of, of the show. Like we hinted at earlier, it's, it's now a, a live show in front of an audience, uh, edited, but, uh, you know, a live uh, performance. Um, 
But for the first several years, it was mostly in the studio. Now, I didn't listen to the show um, at that that point, and I actually right. have a hard time even imagining what it was like. Isn't uh, it stupid? It's, it, seems, it seems like an odd fit. What was it like um, when it was in the studio? It must have been a completely well, different dynamic. It was. It, 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 I mean, it was, it was unbearable. Um, and it probably has a lot to do with our slow growth until that point. I'm sure it has a tremendous amount to do with our slow growth uh, until that point. The, the show was conceived uh, to be done in a studio for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, it was perceived that it would be too hard to fly in this nationally based talent pool to one place every week to tape it. Right, because the panelists were in all different locations. All over, yeah, and they, and they decided that it would be better to have, you know, a national pan, nationally based panel uh, and talent rather than say, you know, Washington based or New York based or wherever it happened to be. Uh, sec- and they didn't, they didn't at that time imagine it would be economically feasible to fly them in. Uh, secondly. Um, Doug Berman uh, is a great believer in editing. Uh, he, it's, he, he, he's on record as saying, you know, to produce great radio, get held, hire the most talented people you can, let them do what they do best, and then edit the hell out of them. And editing is a lot easier in a studio environment because there's no background noise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's just a lot cleaner, a lot easier to do uh, in terms of turning around and, and giving a carefully edited show. Uh, and those are the two primary reasons. Uh, they also, and this is sort of something I only know second or third hand, they say they tried a live version of the show uh, prior to my getting involved with different hosts and panel, and then it didn't work for reasons I don't know. I mean, I, I, what my understanding is is that you know the, the guys trying to be funny made the very understandable mistake of playing to the live audience in front of them rather than to the radio audience that presumably would be listening to them. Right. Um, so, for those reasons, it seemed like a good idea to do it, in the, do it in the studio. And at the time, I mean, it just seemed, well, yeah, those reasons make sense. That's what we'll do. Uh, and then, as soon as we started doing it live, it was so obvious that it was a terrible notion. You know, you, I remember we we did our first live show at this uh, theater on a on a campus in a small college in Salt Lake City. We were invited out there by the station to do it. They paid all our expenses. We didn't get any other money. We just assumed this would be a good thing to do to promote the show. And like, you know, 600 people showed up to see it. And we were like, that's amazing. Uh, what a wonderful thing that this could happen. And people would laugh. And we started doing live shows, you know, about 12 times a year. And every time we do it, it was just obvious that we needed to figure out a way to, to do it every week. And it took a long time. Yeah, because because you first started doing the live shows in two thousand or something, right? And wasn't yes, until two thousand January two thousand was our very first show in front of a live audience. And was the challenge in, in making it all live uh, just the fact that you would have to fly everyone uh, around the country? Like I said, it was a logistical uh, problem. We didn't know. Well, there there were two major logistical problems: flying everyone around the country, which didn't seem practical or, or economical. Uh, and also, where were we going to do it? We didn't have a theater. And while there are lots of theaters in Chicago where we're based, uh, finding one that was available every Thursday night was going to be a, a problem. And, and it's very rare these days to do a radio show in front of a live audience. Very few people do it. Uh, Garrison Keillor does it, and Michael Feldman does it. And that's it, uh, as far as I know. Uh, I mean, you know, in terms of like why you don't do shows in front of live audiences, uh, Ira Glass would be somebody who would explain carefully why you don't do shows, or Jad Adamrod, because you, you you know you have this amazing power to shape sound in a in a theater. I'm sorry, in an editing booth in a, in a studio. And in addition, there's that there's that issue again. You know, I mean, years ago, Ira gave me the classic advice for speaking on the radio, which is you're imagining that you're speaking to one person. Because to the radio listener's perspective, you are. You're speaking to him or her, right? Mm -hmm. You need to speak just the same way I'm talking to you right now. I mean, just as if you're talking to one person. I I found that very hard to do, which is an aside. But the big problem is is that everybody assumes if you're playing in front of a live crowd, you're not going to be doing that. You're playing to the live crowd and leaving all those poor listeners at home out. That's a a common problem with live broadcasts, uh, live audio broadcasts, something that uh, Garrison is very, very good about dealing with and getting around. But it sounds like for you, like you had, uh, you found the feedback in- enormously rewarding and actually uh, ma- made it easier to to know yes. if you're doing a good job as a host. Exactly right, because uh, I am a theater guy, 
and you know, they would tell me that millions of people are listening to this radio show, and I'd be like, really? Can I can't see them? I mean, it's what we were talking about, I think, earlier today when I talked about you know, the value of, of being funny is you get immediate feedback. I thrive on that feedback. I want it. I need to know how well I'm doing. Yeah, it's not quite the same if someone tells you a week later that they like the yeah. show as a, a, an immediate laugh. Nor is it the same as when your friends you're doing the show are laughing with you because we're all on the same side, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and it's not just ego. Uh, it's not, I mean, it, it is a little bit. It's like, oh, yes, they, they like it. It's feedback. I mean, when you're playing to an audience, we're doing comedy in front of an audience, they let you know how you're doing. They let you know if they want more of where you are. And you can keep stay there. They, want you to, they, they let you know if it's time to move on. They let you know if what you're doing isn't working at all. And so you can adjust, you know. Mm-hmm. There have been times where you know I've I've done something on stage that hasn't gone well at all, but I've been able to play off the audience's reaction. Right. So even if you sort of miss, in a way, you can make a joke about missing. Yeah. Oh, you guys don't like that? Well, it's too early for that kind of joke or something like that, and you you can you can get out of it. I mean, the audience gives you someone to play with, and if you do it right, of course, the live audience stands in for the audience at home. They sort of speak for that audience. Like one thing I often say is that it gives us more opportunities to do more dangerous stuff, more edgy stuff, for two reasons. First of all, you know, if we do something edgy and people laugh, then the people listening at home will probably moderate whatever offense they might take because they're like, oh, well, the audience liked it. I don't want to be the stick in the mud. Right. Or if it goes really badly and the audience like boos, and we'll broadcast that sometimes, then it's okay you know, because we got punished, right? Right. So in a way, you get the, the best of both worlds. You have the freedom. You can sort of mess up. And because it's an edited yeah. show, you can take more risks. And you also get the live element. Right. Now, you can screw that up. You, you can make a mistake of where you get so involved in playing to the audience that, and I'm sure you've heard this on the radio sometimes, or, or that, that you understand that everybody in that room is having a wonderful time and you're not quite sure why, but mainly you feel rather excluded from it. Mm-hmm. And that's a danger. And, and I would say we, we made that mistake early on. Being edited helps because if something goes off the rails in that way, you can get rid of it. You know, if you start playing to the audience in a way that, you know, and, and, I mean, sometimes it's obvious. Like when, when Paula Poundstone first started doing her show, she, she loves, if you've ever seen her live show, to play with the audience members. Why are you wearing that? Sir, what is that you're doing? Sir, did, you know, she likes to, and, and of course, you can't do that on our radio show because the listening audience doesn't know what the hell is going on. Right. Um, and if that's obvious, there's also less obvious stuff. Sometimes, you know, we just go on, or we just go off on something because the, the audience in front of us is encouraging us. And all of a sudden it becomes about between us and them and excludes the listener at home. So that's something, you know, that's part of our skill set we all had to learn. Now, in 2005, it becomes a completely live show. And, and you've talked about how this was a, a pretty big turning point, uh, a turning point you could actually point to. Um, right. That you, it was a popular show, but suddenly you felt like you had greater cultural resonance with, with the show. Was there something particular that uh, really struck home for you, like a mention in the media somewhere or some sort of uh, pop culture reference to the show during that time that, that sort of hit it home for you? There were, there were a number of things. Uh, it, I mean, looking back now, it's been, Jesus, almost 10 years, so it's hard to remember. I remember the New York Times. I mean, it, it probably was because, you know, I'm a Jewish kid from New Jersey. So for me, the New York Times is the Bible. The New York Times did a feature on us around that time. And it was really funny because they were like, oh, we, we the New York Times, have now discovered you and we shall now share you as a secret with our audience. And of course, at that point, we had like two million listeners. So we were secret except for the two million people who listened to us every week. And had been on the air for seven years. Right. But that's how it felt. You know, it felt like all, all, even though we had had this, at that point, successful public radio show that had a decent audience. Um, nobody knew the hell we were. And then all of a sudden we were, we were live every week, which was the significant difference. And the New York Times was profiling us and people started mentioning us and, and more and more stations started adding us. So it really, it really was that demarcation. I mean, I, I will, only because I have that New York Times article hanging on my wall right now, I can go over and get it. Uh, I'll think of like that being the, the moment where I knew that you know, we had come to the attention of the people to whom you know, it was attention you want to come to. Do you remember when you actually felt sort of secure as a host or it was sort of like, okay, I, I, know, I know what I'm doing? Like, I've heard you talk about how early on you would try to mimic the voice of Ira Glass even when you were very yes. early on because you didn't know, like, what am I supposed to sound like? That's a good question. Uh, th- there are a number of, uh, of places where I thought, you know, this will work. Uh, maybe it was, you know, I'll, if I thought about it, I'd probably give you a better answer, but the answer I will, the, the first thing left to mind was a show we did in July 2007. Uh, it was in Millennium Park. 
It was a free show. And we, for our guest, got Patrick Fitzgerald. Uh, I don't know how closely you follow American politics. This is the uh, prosecutor in the uh, yes. Scooter Libby case. Very good. Yes. And, and what had happened was is Scooter Libby had just been convicted and his sentence commuted by President Bush. And everybody wanted to talk to um, Patrick. You know, he was the most significant lawyer in the country at that moment because everybody wanted to know what he thought about it. And, and there were a lot more questions like, you know, why didn't he prosecute Dick Cheney or why did he just prosecute Scooter Libby or what did he think Scooter Libby was doing, blah, 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 or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he wouldn't do any of those interviews. He had a very, very strong sense of uh, prosecutorial propriety. Um, and he came and he agreed to be our guest for that show. The way he told me was uh, he, he was engaged to a woman, now his wife, who wanted to come see our show. And he, and he said, are you thinking you can get us tickets? And uh, so he called up and they're like, well, as a matter or, or our call came in and they said, well, can you get some reserved seats for my, my girlfriend and her friends? And we're like, we think we can do that. <laughs> and so we had this big night, 10,000 people showed up to see us, our largest audience ever. We had national news coverage because we were talking to uh, Patrick Fitzgerald. Um, and I remember being backstage and talking to him and I said, why are you doing our show? And he said, well, why aren't you doing anybody else's? He said, because your show... I can, I can answer your questions. And I remember very specifically, uh, I had written this joke. And the joke was this. I said to him, so you live uh, on the north side of Chicago? He said, yes. And you work downtown at the federal building? He said, yes. I said, what are your, what's your opinion about commuting? <laughs> and uh, there was this little huge ripple of laughter, you know, and I was like, okay, that worked. <laughs> and maybe that's it, you know. And then it was written up in the papers the next day and it was on CNN. And, you know, and it wasn't just the attention. It was like we were this moment. For that moment, you know, we were the most interesting thing going on in American news and politics. It passed. It didn't last long. As soon as he walked off stage, in fact, all the national media left um, because they didn't care about our silly radio show. But just for that moment, we, we had sort of found our way in the center of the conversation before it moved on. And, and having a crowd of 10,000 isn't, isn't bad for a public radio show. Yes, it doesn't suck either. I mean, and, you know, and John Stewart gets that every week and he deserves it. But, you know, that was our moment, our first. We've had some others. And I was like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we're doing this okay. Now, I want to ask you a bit about the actual process of, of putting together this show. You, you've said that one of the most annoying questions you get is, what do you do with the rest of your week? That is uh, annoying, yes. Yeah. So could you give us an idea of, of sort of what goes into making the show each week? Basically, the pace of the week picks up with the week's news uh, because we have to wait for things to happen before we can make fun of them. So when we come in on Monday, we don't really know what the show is going to be because the week hasn't happened yet. And we have a, you know, an obstacle in that we're always taped on Thursday nights that gives us really a small margin to stay up to date. You know, John Oliver is doing his show on Sundays. I don't know when he tapes, but uh, that gives him all week to figure out what the week's news is. We're, we're a little tighter than that because we're on, you know, broadcast Saturday morning. That means that we want to wait until we see what things develop. There's still things we do on Mondays. Um, we can do production work. We can start, you know, uh, following up on stuff that followed up from last week. We can talk about ways to follow up. We talk about the reaction to last week's show. Um, we start thinking about things that we might be able to set up. But more or so, less, yeah. so you can't you can't do too much planning, though. Yeah, we can't do that because if you know if we go nuts on a story that happened over the weekend, people will tune in Saturday and go, "Yeah, that's right, on Sunday." You know, and they won't be thinking about it. You know, we'll we'll seem really out of date after the newscast and Scott Simon on Saturday morning. I mean, you know, it, it always works out brilliantly is if there's a funny, if there's a leading story, say, on the morning news on Saturday, and then they hear us and we're making great jokes about it. That's what we love. And so do you have a routine when you come in and you, you and the writers come in on, on Monday? Do you have a routine of, of how you go about doing it or how, like, go-to sources? Well, everybody has their own, which works out well because everybody, you know, we're slightly competitive, right? So we're all, because we're constantly sending each other stories through email, right? Right. And I guess if you can get a story that you sort of right. pitched in, then that's sort of a, a, a small win. Right. So the competition has worked out well since, you know, everybody wants to have their own sources that they can contribute more stuff. I mean, nobody gets penalized for not doing it or doing it more. There are no rewards, but it's nice to be the first with a funny story that ends up on the show. And that means that we all have our own little secrets. Uh, my secret really isn't much of a secret. I, I tend to work on the, on, on the top of the show as sort of my beat meaning the lead stories. So I try to stay uh, as, as up as I can on, on what's going on, even if it's not necessarily funny. Right. So it's your job to follow the news, essentially. Yeah, in a weird way. But I mean, 
it, it's my job to follow the news in a kind of surprisingly straightforward way because I'm the guy who has to lead the conversation. And a lot of times if you listen to the show, you'll hear once – like let's, let's take a, a story like um, the Bowie Bergdahl. Uh, I'm not sure if this happened. But we're, we did a piece on Bowie Bergdahl, right, the prisoner of war. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we, you know, we had a quote. We, we, we did a couple of jokes. Uh, and then the panel dug in. Well, one thing that might happen with the panel is they'll say, well, what guy, did this guy desert? I heard he deserted. And I'd say something like, well, he, he, he seems to have been off post. We don't know whether he deserted or if he just wandered away. Right. And that's my role. So you're almost the straight man at times. Oh, absolutely the straight man. Because my job is to, at that moment, is to sort of pitch things to the panel so they can do something with it. Yeah. And, uh, and not only I mean, is my job to pitch stuff to the panel that they may be able to do something with, but sometimes, you know, sometimes I get in good stuff. Like, like there was a good moment, a number of people mentioned it to me, so I remember it. We were talking about some silly story where a guy had like come up with the most expensive drink at Starbucks ever. Mm-hmm. It had 60 shots of espresso. Right. Somebody said, you know, what does he do for a living? And I said, he trembles. He works as a washing machine <laughs> agitator. And, you know, which is a pretty good joke. And it completely came off the cuff. I hadn't thought of that at all uh, until that moment. So, and that's great because sometimes you get in a groove, you get in the zone or whatever you want to call it. And, and, and so I need to be ready to do that, you know. And so do you purposely leave, you and the other panelists purposely leave sort of spaces where you don't know what's going to happen or where you it's just okay we'll we'll try to riff on on this sort of idea or this new yeah we, we absolutely i mean sometimes in the script it'll in fact especially in this top stories there'll be bracket where it says panel and I, my job at that point is to say what do you guys think or just look at them or let them in if they're eager to go in let them in if they're not eager to go in, say, what do you guys think sometimes we even write in questions like would you would you make a prisoner swap like that i, that, I think i'm making that one up but you know where we, we, we really thrive. If you, you, you went to see our, our live show in, uh, in New York, right? Mm-hmm. I met you on the afterwards. And I don't know if you listened to the edited version afterwards. But if I, you, I listened to part of it, yeah. Yeah. If you, listen, if, if you were to compare the edited version to the live version you saw, you will see that there's a real there's an emphasis in the, in the edited version on, on panel stuff, on improvisational panel stuff. Because we think that's where our show lives, more so than the written gags. Do the panelists ever uh, say, oh, please include this bit or could you not include that bit? I mean, once once the show has actually been recorded. Very, 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 very rarely. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I don't edit the show, so I don't get those requests. Every now and then, I think a panelist might say, oh, I regret saying that. Please don't put that in. Do you ever make those type of requests? Uh, I have gotten to the point where I trust them well enough to know that if it's going to make me look terrible, they won't put it in. They'll make <laughs> yeah. you look silly. Yeah. You know, they'll make me look, you know, goofy, but they won't like make me look bad. Do, do you get now that you've been doing the show for so many years and it's basically absurd things in, in the headlines, do your friends uh, send you weird stuff that they find? Is, is oh, it that yeah. sort of thing where you get, you've started to attract uh, just sort of by osmosis outside stuff? So, yeah, people, people often say, to me, oh, I bet we'll hear this on this show. But my friends generally, what's weird about my friends is my friends don't sort of voice that stuff on me for some reason. Every now and then somebody will send me, oh, did you, I, I saw this story and thought of you, Peter. But uh, no, generally speaking, uh, my, my friends, you know, for the most part, knew me before this thing got big and, and thank God don't treat me uh, any different than they ever did before, <laughs> which is, I think, valuable. And how did the internet, I mean, obviously the internet was already around when the show was, was started, yeah. right? in terms of uh, its role and how much we tend to consume online compared to uh, through the newspaper or television has completely changed. Has that uh, changed a lot, the sources you actually find since the show originally started compared to now? Well, I mean, I've always said the show couldn't exist without the internet because we wouldn't be able to find the material. Right. Those obscure things that happened in uh, Louisiana or something. Right, exactly. I mean, it's never going to, we never find them. I mean, we need a staff of 20 to, I don't know how you'd even do it, read up, you know, call around, read. I, it's impossible. But, you know, the, the other good thing, uh, in addition to finding the material, is, you know, everybody we, we, we talk to, everybody who listens, I should say, um, are also on the internet all day, just like everybody else, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, so they're on top of the things in the same way that we are, you know? 
they're sending us they're, they're you know when we mention a story uh, particularly the top stories they've been reading about it they've been following it they've read the stories in the new york times they've read the stories in the internet and so there's a there's a much wider familiarity with everything we can assume a certain familiarity with everything uh that we wouldn't be able to do without the internet so i mean it, i think it just adds to the you know general expectation of of knowledge that we can have on our listeners now what, one of my favorite segments is the the not my job segment where you have yes, a, a celebrity come on uh and talk about something that is sort of completely the opposite of their area of expertise yes uh, um now i mean it's gotten a lot bigger in, in recent years i mean when you first started it was mostly uh public radio figures that that came on uh, i think you had right. Ira glass on five or six times yes things. yes you really have done your your uh your research i appreciate that <laughs> so so uh, how how often does the celebrity have no idea about the show or ha- who you are it, it is often it, it, it's it's less often but it occasionally happens i just spoke to uh the guy we're interviewing uh this week he's uh his name is nick he's one of the guys from the seven up series and he's never heard it in his life uh but we pursued him, and we thought it'd be fun to have him on the show. Uh, we're going up to Wisconsin, where he is a professor. Um, and every now and then, we get somebody like uh, Paul Krugman, who, as he once told me, doesn't listen to public radio, but his his staff really wanted him to be on the show. So he's like, which is surprising because you'd think he's the demographic. <laughs> I know. No, I met him at a. He was. I, I, I. He told me that when I was at a public radio convention, <laughs> and he was there. And he was there, and I said, "It's a pleasure to meet you." And I, I host a show called "Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me." It's on public radio, and he's like, "Yeah, I really don't listen to public radio." He was just selling a book, so he had a chance to go. Um, thank you, Paul. And how do you prepare for those bits? I speak to every single guest personally beforehand. Uh, beforehand, and I do it uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first reason is because years ago we had a guest on who I didn't speak to. I won't even tell you who it is, who I was told knew what was going in, what he was getting into and what was happening. And we got to the quiz. I said, now we're going to ask you three silly questions. And he said, you're going to do what? And it was a profoundly embarrassing moment. He had no idea what we were doing. And, and his discomfort with the whole thing was so palpable that I swore, as God is my witness, um, I would talk to them myself and make sure they knew. And in this conversation that you would have beforehand, say with with Paul Krugman or or uh, whomever, what what are you what are you doing or what are you saying? Well, this is what I do. Um, I say hi. You know, do you know our show? And they say sometimes they say yes, of course, I love it. And I say great. Well, this will be easy. You're going to be the not my job guest. You know how this works. Uh, if they say no, I say well, let me describe it. It's a comedy show disguised as a quiz. If they're older, I say it's a combination of the Daily Show and You Bet Your Life. I'm the host. We have panel. This is what the most of the hour is. This is what you're going to do. And most of it is spent just saying, you don't have to worry about getting anything right. You don't have to worry about looking bad. We want to make you look good. The thing I say to everybody, and I usually repeat it two or three times before I'm done with the conversation, is the more fun we have with each other, the more fun the audience has. So just relax and have a good time. I I assure them, because this has come up from time to time, nobody cares whether they win or lose. (laughs) <laughs> I tell them the show is not live, it's live to tape, meaning that we are going to make sure that everybody is brilliant when the edit is done. And, 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 there's another, and those, those are sort of the overt reasons why I do it. You, know, I want them, you want to put them at ease. I want to put them at ease, because sometimes they come on and they're nervous, and I want to put them at ease. But there's two other things. The first thing is, is I find that if I've had a conversation with somebody, I have a better time talking to them once we're interviewing. If that's not the first time we've spoken. You, you feel like you already have a rapport that way? Yeah, I feel like we've spoken. You know, we, maybe we, some jokes passed between us. Maybe we had a moment. Maybe we talked about something we knew. It's also a way of, of, of getting through the throat clearing, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, I really love your work, or, or we're so excited to have you on, or, you know, I've, 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 I've seen your movies, you know? I mean, we get, and if it's somebody I really admire, it's also good to get that out of the way in private, right? And then we don't waste a lot of time when they're on the air saying, oh, you're so great. Right. Because you've had huge people. You, I mean, you had Barack Obama, then Senator Barack Obama and, and Tom Hanks and huge, huge, huge guests. We have. And it's been great. And sometimes I'm in awe of these guys. Uh, I mean, I, one example I think of when I'm talking about this problem is we had Brad Bird on. And Brad Bird made The Incredibles, which I think, and The Iron Giant, which are like two of the greatest animated movies ever made. And so when I was talking to him on the phone, I was able to go on about how much I love The Incredibles and, and all the reasons I, I loved it. And, 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 and I was able to be very specific and, you know, 
And then when he came on the show, I, I was able to move right to a question that was like, you know, in your new movie, which was Ratatouille, the villain is some guy who's merchandising off of success. Really? I mean, my kid sleeping in their Incredibles, <laughs> you know, it's jammies, and you're telling me that's the bad guy? I mean, and that's, you know, better radio. Yeah. It wasn't mean, it was a joke, and he responded pretty well. Well, you have to have a, a hint of truth to, to, to have anything have any punch to it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my point is, is I think the audience enjoyed hearing that more than they would have gone on about how much I love The Incredibles. Right. Although he knew I loved The Incredibles, so he was at ease, you know. Right, so, so it, it takes was, away the fawning and you can be a bit more reverent. Yeah, nobody likes that. I hate that, you know, when you turn on anybody and they're like, oh, you're so great and I just love what you do. It's like, yeah, shut up. Because it really, it really is, I mean, let's face it, when you do that, it really is more about you than the person you're talking to. Right, whereas the great thing about the celebrities on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is that they're part of the the audience essentially it's it's sort of uh, an egalitarian uh, sense to it yes exactly no matter how yeah. big the person is yeah and, and another thing that I, I like to think is true and i think is true because they tell me it's true is a lot of times for big celebrities who've done a lot of interviews that we're a lot of fun because it's just different you know i mean it's just a different experience they don't get asked the same questions it's not the same tone they're teased particularly if they're very very serious people they enjoy it uh, and, and, and most of the time they come back to us and they say, oh, wow, that was really kind of awesome. Thank you. Now, the typical prize of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is, is Carl Castle's voice on your home answering machine. Um, and I, I love this so much because I think it speaks so much about the tone of the, the show itself. It's silly. It's a, you know, yes. it's a prize, but, you know, no one's taking themselves very seriously. How did that actually become the prize? The, the story is, is that it was way early in the development of the show before we went on the air and they were trying to think of some prize uh, and they were thinking probably along the lines of you know what the puzzler does on weekend edition Sunday you get a, like a lapel pin or lapel pin or whatever yeah um, a tote and bag a tote bag or something and they were, they were thinking maybe, maybe they were gonna be, it was going to be something weird and then you know somebody just came up. Carl was involved in the show at that time, of course. And somebody came up with the idea of like, well, you know, when just for, for a placekeeper, we'll just say Carl will do their voicemail message or answering machines. Back it was old enough so that we actually had answering machines. And and so it was sort of a placekeeper, and and they kept it. And and I'm glad they did because you know, frankly, uh, it's the best prize. And it sort of helps set the whole tone too. It, it helps set the whole tone. My joke about it for years has been. It's priceless and it's worthless. You can't sell it. You can't buy it. Um, and that makes me happy. Uh, you know, it, it, I mean, because it really befits the nature of the show, which is that it's a quiz show that's just, it's a fake quiz show. Just like, you know, the, the Daily Show is a fake news show. We're a fake quiz show. And in, in that, yeah, we're a quiz show. We ask questions and answers, but there are no, nobody cares who wins or loses. And there's no real prize. And if we were giving out something that had like monetary value, even if it was like a book, then I think it would change the game. Yeah. And I, I think, and not for the better. I love the fact that basically everybody's doing this as a goof. We're doing it as a goof. People have done it as a goof. And people are calling and doing it as a I mean, people love having Carl's voice. It's a prestige thing. Um, but, you know, I think it's perfect for us. I'm, I'm really glad we have that as our prize. I think that's helped us more than anything, uh, more than any early decision. That was a great one. Now, of course, Carl just recently retired, uh, but he's still doing the, the voicemails uh, as the prize. Are you worried at all that to even have a, a home answering device is, uh, even that's uh, pretty arcane now. Uh, do you think you're going to have to change it? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, people put it on their phone voicemails. You know, I say voicemail. Um, that's fine. I think people still love it. You know, we get plenty of, we get hundreds of calls every week. People, um, people you know who who want to do it and want to win this prize so i guess it's still working mm -hmm. I mean, well, if there ever comes if there ever comes a day when carl can't do it then i don't know what we'll do at that point i don't even want to think about that yeah well i mean uh, the show has been around for i i guess it would be 17 years Six, 16 16 16, years. 16, uh, 16 and some yeah I, I became the host in may of 1998 are you sort of amazed or do you get the chance at all to look back and sort of see what it's become and how humble its origins were really uh, and now it's become one of the most I guess staple or public of public radio shows like it's really identified with NPR uh, it really is isn't that amazing yeah are you amazed or do you get the chance to look back at both your own role and the shows 
I, I am kind of amazed. Uh, and yet at the same time, you know, I remember talking to a producer for Stephen Colbert some years ago, and he said, you know, there's this book they have. And every week, you know, the collected scripts, I mean, every day for them, the collected scripts for the show goes into the book. And he, he talks about, he talked about like feeding the beast, you know, you can feel good about what you did, but tomorrow you're going to have to do it again mm -hmm. and do it again. And, and that really is it. I mean, you know, we may have had a great show last week. Um, people might have loved it. Um, it was really funny. It was successful. Well, now we, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost as if I, you know, referring back to what I said earlier, about you know having the, the glory of being able to do it again every week. Now we have to do it again every week. We can't. We I, so it, I, my focus is much more in like getting it done every week and trying to make it more interesting and trying to make it funnier and trying to get through the process. As as we were saying before, I mean, when you when, when the show started, I think even more so than today, uh, NPR had this very serious minded brand. You know, like they, you were saying, there was even a question of how non sort of serious newsy you could be as a quiz show. Do you think in the time that's elapsed since then that there's there's sort of more space for for different types of, of voices on NPR or in public radio more generally. Well, I think so. I think so. It's hard for I mean, it's hard for me to say from my perspective. I think that two two things have happened. Uh, there there's been a, a success of our show, which I think has helped change the tone a little. But there's also been the rise of a lot of younger people who want to do public radio. Uh, by younger, you know, you're talking about 30s and 40s as opposed to 50s and 60s, but still, you yeah. know, and these are people, I mean, one of the things is, is you know, I get people who c come up to me now and say, I grew up on your show. And you're like, really? Well, yeah, they're, you know, they're 23. The show's 16 years old. Yeah, they grew up on the show. And, you know, these people are listening to public radio. And, I, and, and well, that and, must be quite amazing to hear. It's a little humbling. It's a little makes you feel old. Um, but at the same time, they want to hear something. Some of these people are going into public radio, although they tend to be doing it by doing podcasts. But then the podcasts become public radio shows. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of awesome. You know, there's a, there's a great podcast called Love and Radio, which is done by people in their 20s, which is awesome. There, there's, there's uh, you know, a lot of contributors to This American Life, and, and all the people of This American Life is inspired. You know, they're out there. They're doing stuff. Uh, this whole storytelling movement, which is enormous. You know, so, so all of this stuff is happening. I, I won't take a lot of credit for it. I think that we showed that you can be successful doing one particular thing on NPR that NPR hadn't done before, which was, i.e., do an hour of comedy, mm -hmm. um, which, is, which was hard enough given the NPR. There was no tradition of it. But I, I think, generally speaking, people are inspired. I mean, the people who are, I mean, I, I'm very glad we're doing, I think we have a wonderful audience and, 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 and they're grateful and they're happy. But the people who are really being inspired are being inspired by things like The Moth and by Ira Glass. I mean, you know, what's Snap Judgment? Snap Judgment, which is a relatively new show by Glenn Washington, that's, you know, obviously inspired by Ira Glass, not us. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say what's going on. I th I th I'm glad to see that the, this stuff is happening because I think it means public radio won't sort of age and die out, Yeah, which is always a problem. But, you know, we're doing okay. And, and you procrastinated before. Uh, before you, when you were a playwright, by listening to public radio and reading the newspaper. Now that you've done this for so many years, uh, can you still enjoy them when you're not actually actively working on the show? Can you still enjoy listening yeah. to public radio and reading the news? You know what's funny is is that what, these days when I when I'm off the show for a week or so, and we're not off that much, we have a pretty tough production schedule. I tend to avoid the news entirely because it's gotten to the point where I can't read the news without thinking about it in terms of a. Thinking how it might fit it. into place on, yeah, on the yeah, show. Yeah, exactly. And it's just tiring. So I tend to avoid it. I avoid all current events in my weeks off. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah. I try, I try to unplug to the extent I can. And my final question is, you, you said uh, somewhat, something that I found quite interesting. You said uh, it's more of a challenge uh, and more of a reward to your listeners uh, to be yourself. And I was wondering, like, as, as someone who has sort of admitted to being a bit anxious or being uh, sort of self-conscious, um, where are you with that now? Like, ha have you come to a place where it's natural uh, and sort of almost easy to be yourself on the air? That's a, a complicated question. Uh, I, I think there's been sort of a parallel movement in that both I, I've, I've allowed, I mean, when I listen to myself as, 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 you know, very early on, I sound very forced and stiff and performing compared to the way I sound now. I sound very nervous. I sound like I'm trying to cover something up. 
And I think that I have relaxed and my, my on-air persona has moved closer to my real persona. At the same time, my real persona has moved on, has moved closer to my on-air persona. I mean, you can't do this every week for 16 years and not have it affect how you generally think or feel, you know? So, so it's changed you. It has. I mean, you know, I've been a, I've been a successful radio host for, and, and, and you can't just drop that and walk out. I mean, and, I mean, obviously I'm different. I mean, you may have noticed I haven't been making as many jokes as I usually do in the air in our conversation. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you just get used to speaking in a certain way professionally, and that leaches over into your personal life. So, you know, it's it's much harder to tell the difference between the person I am on the air and the person I am off in the air than it used to be. But I don't know if that's because I become more genuine or more fake in my regular life. Would you say it's made you more comfortable? Yeah, I think so. I feel a lot more comfortable on stage, uh, you know, and on radio than I used to, without question. And I mean, congruence is never a bad thing between, uh, yeah, between your on-air self and off-air self. True, and and you know, there's also the additional thing. It's just confidence, you know. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and people seem to like me. I think I can relax a little bit, can't I? I, I, I certainly think so. Yeah. Well, it's so much fun to listen to each week, and uh, I certainly can't imagine anyone else doing it quite well, as well as you do. So, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Peter Sagal, for hosting Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and, and thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Great. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Well, that was my conversation with Peter Sagal, host of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And that's it for Ready Waves this week. To keep up to date with Ready Waves, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook. And you can always check us out online at readywaveshow.com. And a special request, if you like the show and uh, listen to us in iTunes or Stitcher, if you could write us a review, it would be a big help. Music was provided by The Years and Poddington Bear, both found at the Free Music Archive. Our logo was designed by Joseph Nowak. And a very special thanks this week to J.B. Davidson for helping with the audio. And if you have any comments, you can reach me at kevin at thepublicradio.org. I'm Kevin Kaners. I'll see you in two weeks' time.